Salams as always from the People's Dispatch Studios here in New Delhi. You're watching the Daily Debrief. And the salams are a little bit extra loud and extra special today because it is May Day, of course. Um, the day when workers, particularly those who have the conditions and the ability to organize around the world, celebrate, reaffirm their commitment to workers' struggles and remind one another of the importance of workers' unity. Many of you might have seen articles today listing the significance of the day as well as its, hist its history. Uh, so instead, we'll be talking specifically about labor movements in the current context in the world we live in today. Uh, it's 2023 and labor faces all kinds of issues uh, around the world. Joining us first on the show today will be People's Dispatch's Prashant. Prashant, of course, covers as well as manages the coverage of working class movements around the world and will be talking to us about the challenges faced by movements uh, in 2023. We will also speak to Sujna from the Tricontinental Institute of Social Research uh, about a dossier that has been released by the Institute today uh, on the conditions specifically about India's vast and diverse working class. We look at those conditions, of course, but also how many of those find commonality and serve to emphasize what workers as well as labor movements around the world today are dealing with. Uh, Prashant, at People's Dispatch, uh, the, the work largely involves covering uh, movements and, and labor plays a central, is a central theme in that. Uh, in that context and in the context of the world in which we live, what do you see the significance this May Day? Well, Siddharth, it's important to sort of look at the world we're living in uh, when we talk about May Day, because it is May Day, is, of course, it's a day of workers, it's a day of celebration, it's a day of struggle. And it's a day of struggle because precisely of the conditions, the material conditions that are there. And like the recent Oxfam report from <clears throat> January says, the world's richest 1%, they have captured two-thirds of all the wealth created since 2020. Now, just imagine that two-thirds of all the wealth for just 1%. And the remaining 99% of people have to make do with the rest. So this is the world of inequality. This is the world of, for lack of better word, corruption. Because <clears throat> this kind of inequality is pure corruption that we live in today. And who is bearing the brunt of this? It is definitely the workers, right? So it is definitely the workers across the world who are facing uh, the, you know, the impact of this inequality. And we need to sort of remember that this amount of concentration of wealth takes place because what should rightly belong, rightly belong to the workers is not being given to them, mm -hmm. whether it be in terms of, you know, policies from the government or steps from the employers. So maybe at this point of time is very, very important precisely because the sheer scale of injustice and, you know, inequality that exists, it requires a res resistance response from organized labor. And that's one aspect. Now, the second aspect, which is more, you know, recent would be the impact of the Ukraine war. And one of the key aspects has been a huge increase in inflation across the world. Now, we know that the increase in inflation, while many, uh, you know, Many analysts say, oh, it's a war, it's a war. But how exactly is it? Is the war, say, affecting a country like maybe South Africa or affecting a country in Latin America? A lot of it has to do with the policies of these, own, these governments themselves, mm. which, when confronted with a crisis like the Ukraine war, have kept on their old you know, ways of doing things, which means if there's a food shortage, if there is you know, a shortage of, you know, if, there, if fuel prices are increasing, these countries have absolutely refused to intervene in many cases. In many other cases, they have actually increased, uh, you know, stood by while prices are increased. And this has actually led to a huge immiseration of the working class, which is, of course, the majority in the world. Now, uh, keeping all these things in mind, it is no surprise that there has been this avalanche of protests and strikes in almost every country. And this is this has definitely been a year of mass struggles, whether it be the United States, whether it be some of the poorer countries in the world. You know, tens of thousands of people, as we speak, for instance, we know that in the United Kingdom, uh, teachers, doctors, health professionals, all of them taking to the streets in large numbers because the government just stubbornly refuses to increase pay to match inflation. Mm -hmm. Workers across the world in many cases are not even asking for huge pay rises. They're saying, give us salary increases which match the inflation, which is as reasonable a demand as it should be. But governments, again, refusing to do that. And like I said, we've seen this in so many places. For instance, in France, you have pension reforms, which basically seek to increase the number of years country workers are going to work. Similarly, in Paraguay, in Uruguay, at the same time, there have been protests going on against a very similar pension reform. So pension reforms continue to be part of that package. In India, we have seen, for instance, Indian workers taking out protest after protest. There was a huge rally on April 5th this year 
against what are called the labor codes, whereby labor laws are being dismantled to make mm. it more friendly to the employers. And then, you know, you go to maybe a country like the United States, where you have, uh, I think, for instance, UPS workers, workers who are delivering parcels, are likely, uh, you know, preparing for what could be one of the biggest strikes in the history of the country. Because although these are essential workers, they are not, you know, they're being forced to work long hours. Again, the terms and conditions of their work are being dismantled so that uh, you know, corporates can make more money. So yeah. this is definitely a global phenomenon. And that is something that is a major issue we need to consider. And that's really why I think there's been this huge increase in protests. Like you rightly pointed out, Prashant, since the 80s, the, the dismantling of the post, uh, you know, post-war structure and, and then decades and decades of austerity measures have led to uh, the situation wherein where uh, largely labor are kind of backed into a corner and feel like protesting is, is the only way out. Uh, there has also been a sort of a, a rise in attempts to create divisions in the unity uh, of workers, which has led uh, a rise in populist right-wing uh, sort of political parties and groups emerging. Uh, what, how do you see the challenges uh, for organized labor in particular going forward? Right. So like I said, two or three major challenges. One is something, uh, you know, you, one is basically the fact that governments and employers across the world are seeking to divide workers in various ways. For instance, there is the old, you know, there's a classic technique of whereby some workers, especially the more senior workers, are given different terms and conditions. And junior workers who do exactly the same kind of work are often made contract employees given lesser amounts of pay. So there's been a huge struggle in many parts of the world to actually uh, strike back against that, to make the statement that we are not going to accept uh, you know, this attempt to divide our, to, to divide us based on whether we are senior or junior and give us these kind of categories of work. On the other hand, like you said, also a huge increase in right-wing politics, which tries to posit the migrants, the mm. refugees, those who come from other parts of the world is somehow the enemy and not the government's own policies or not the policies of what we would call neoliberalism, which mm. says that, oh, it's because it's this foreigner who's trying to come to take your jobs. That is a yeah. problem. And again, organized labor, I think, at the forefront of trying to destroy this very, very dangerous myth that somehow it is people coming from abroad. And I think a very key area of protest in the th one third aspect has also been, for instance, the resistance against international financial institutions like the IMF and the World Bank. You've seen this in countries like Pakistan, you've seen this in countries like Sri Lanka, you've seen this in countries like Ghana, where organized labor has been in the forefront of saying that, you know what, the kind of conditions that the IMF is imposing in order to give loans, they are not sustainable. They are leading to massive uh, rise in prices, they are leading to retrenchments, they are leading to privatization, they are leading to you know a freezing of salaries, all of which are destroying our lives and livelihoods. So, mm -hmm. you know, these are like, I think, three or four areas which the workers of the world uh, are really facing at this point of time. Of course, there are a lot of many, many challenges. For instance, women workers facing, a, a, you know, an ex additional set of challenges, which actually, uh, in, in addition to these, but very important to remember, I think that uh, across the world, many of the struggles are sort of focused on addressing these issues. Like, right? how do you sort of try to reverse uh, the steps, steps such as contractualization, steps such as privatization, which have been imposed on the diktats of the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank? How do you sort of, which is why I think uh, organized labor in many ways is also a key part of progressive movements, of radical movements across the world, saying that, you know, this is not purely an economic issue. This is not purely an issue of just salaries. This is an issue of governance. This is an issue of policy. Mm. This is an issue of politics. So there is no, you I know, mean, organized labor, the workers of the world, you cannot, you can't, they can't just, we can't just say that, you know, they are, they are issues are away from politics because it is really uh, the issue. It is politics is the battleground where a lot of these fights are being fought. So very interesting uh, time because we also know that issues like climate change coming to the fore. A lot of countries talking about transitioning to green energy, to more sustainable forms of, uh, you know, uh, producing energy. But what this often means is that, again, a few rich corporates are making a killing out of this transition. And I think South Africa is a very good example of that, which is why the National Union of Metal Workers in South Africa has been in the forefront of, uh, you know, highlighting this issue that energy green transition needs to be in a way that is sustainable for the workers as well, not just sustainable for capitalists, which is what is happening right now. So all of these, I think, are very, very important uh, struggles that are going to take place in the months, 
in the coming years ahead. Hmm. Whether we look at it as a curse or not, Prashant, we do live in interesting times and, and I, I wish you this May Day, uh, another year of solid reporting at People's Dispatch. Thanks for uh, your time today. Thanks, sir. Now, as I was saying earlier, uh, the Tricontinental Institute for Social Research has released an important do dossier today presenting an analysis of the conditions of the Indian working class. I quote a bit now from the dossier itself and then we'll go across to Sujana who has worked on it and has all the details. Uh, two facts shattered the appearance of calm in contemporary India, the dossier reads. First, COVID-19 exposed the decades-long evisceration of India's health system and the utter incompetence of a central government that was keener to ask the public to bang pots than to offer scientifically-based calm leadership. Second, Indian farmers and peasants held a year-long protest during the pandemic against three bills put forward by the central government that threatened the existence of farming in India. Their protest, which received support from the working class and from large sections of the middle class as well, was able to prevail against a government that does not have the habit of retreat. Uh, this is a little bit of context and we go across to Sujana now via video conference for more. Sujana, thanks very much for joining us uh, this May Day. Uh, Tricontinental has uh, released a dossier uh, today to mark the day also, but also to... Uh, give a broad sort of understanding of the conditions that are facing the Indian working class uh, today. Could you, uh, for the benefit of our uh, sort of wider global audience, uh, kind of summarize that dossier and tell us what the key points are in your opinion? Okay. Uh, first, thank you for inviting me uh, to talk here. And, uh, you know, it's, I would say, uh, I would just, you know, uh, in the dossier, we mentioned lockdown. So, and the COVID uh, thing that has happened. Mm. So, uh, in a way, the COVID lockdown and the distress of the workers, because particularly the migrant workers, or in fact, we, can, we should just say workers because much of India's workforce is actually a migrant workforce. Mm. So, what happened there, it actually tore the wheel of the conditions of Indian working class. So, all the fairy tales that the government has been trying to feed to the media, to the middle class, to the world uh, in general, that, you know, this neoliberal reforms and the labor flexibility and the growth, all this 7%, 6%, 8% growth that has like, you know, increased the employment of workers, increased their living conditions, their food intake has increased, the living conditions have increased. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the COVID lockdown has and the COVID crisis itself has toned down the way. You know, if you look at other countries, the discussion around COVID is, you know, the treatment is not being given properly and, you know, people are dying and, it's about lockdown. Why should we wear masks? Why we should not wear masks? Or in case of China, you know, uh, that China is being very stringent in lockdowns and in all that. But in India, it was entirely different. It was little, much, much less about how many people are dying and healthcare because everybody knew that anyway, it's in shambles. The more of it was, you know, people, uh, people going hungry, people, uh, you know, throw, being thrown out of their houses. Because Indian working class situation is such that if you don't work for a week, if you don't work for 15 days, then that means you're, you know, you don't have any backup savings, you know, to yeah. prevent you and your family from starvation, to prevent you from, you know, being kicked out onto the out onto the curb. Because as it is, they live in slums and in the shanties. Even in those shanties, they cannot afford if they don't work for a week or 15 days. So people were on the streets. And that's what India's whole COVID crisis, the biggest thing about COVID crisis has been that, you know, it is it has just shown to the world, laid bare the conditions of Indian working class, how much ever the government tried to, you know, hide it uh, through media and everything. It was just out in the open. Every Indian could see because people, you know, workers are passing on the roads, uh, yeah. in bare feet, sometimes bleeding, and people were, they were depending on people's charity, you know, kind people's charity, not on government. Government did very little. Uh, so I think we, that's why we mentioned the lockdown. And in that uh, in the crisis, you know, one thing, two things, you know, are very interlinked about Indian working class that come out is unemployment. I mean, that is the situation of world working class anyway. But yeah. in India, situation has been really bad. I mean, uh, this underemployment, unemployment has been a chronic situation in it for Indian working class from the inception. Because when I say working class here, I also consider the agricultural workers, the huge. Mm. Uh, about, uh, you know, these landless or near landless agricultural workers in villages. So in Indian economics, Indian policy, underemployment, unemployment has always been the issue when we come to working class. I mean, forget conditions, forget wages, forget 
the fact that you know they're not they don't have any work to work. even demand the minimum wage yeah. or you know they just have a partial work and also the fact that you know much of the uh, indian working class which would be considered working class is just i mean uh, so unemployed so unemployed that it's not even considered as a work, uh, part of workforce anymore yeah. i mean for a country that is so poor for people who are living on such low wages and you know with such little amenities that they live on mm. uh, only 40% of the you know work people who are uh, capable of work are working yeah. yeah is that because we are lazy is that because you know we have enough luxuries that we don't because just there is no employment there is no point in going out there and looking for work so mm. that is the condition of the indian work i mean workforce uh so this whole fairy tale of you know new, uh, the, the growth has creating employment and secure employment is totally gone with the covid uh, with the you know the crisis of what has happened and if, if you look at the indian work, working class conditions mm. there is lot of migrant workers coming into urban areas because india's population has increased but uh, you know government has not been investing in rural areas at all mm. like in 60s 70s you know when uh, the green revolution was happening there was a lot of capital being generated in the villages rural mm. areas even if it is being generated in the rural rich but it was being invested in the rural areas employment was getting created in agriculture and out of agriculture in rural areas there was a small small entrepreneurs small small industries cottage industries that is coming up on that capital so there was you know growth of employment in that time now you know with the rise of ambani and adani government does just not interested in either public sector because private sector investment always follows public sector investment that has mm. been the story of india public mm. sector invested and private sector investment followed government mm. now uh, just lost interest in rural area there is no absolutely no investment there you build some roads so that people can mig- travel on the road and migrate out to cities no investment in agriculture no investment in irrigation and so what is happening the capital is flowing out into real estate capital is flowing into banks but not into industries uh and you know when you are promoting adani ambani and you are uh, you know you are growing their riches at the expense of rest of the small scale industry mm. what happens to the workers the mm. who are dependent 90 more than 90% of the workers are dependent on the small scale industries or establishments or service establishments of various kinds mm. and uh, so uh, when you say small industries are dying down then you know you are killing the workers yep. it's not just about industry it's actually more about the workers what does adani ambani and the enterprises of that kind how many people do they employ they employ you know 2% of india's workforce and imagine and, and for a for industry or for enterprises that employ 2% of the indian's population and you know what the space of national imagination that they take you know the space they hog in media the space they hog in terms of policy is yeah. just too much Shushma, thanks very much for your time today and for joining us this may day uh, greetings to you from people's dispatch Thank you for calling. And finally, in a new report released in the occupied West Bank yesterday, Médecins Sans Frontières or Doctors Without Borders sheds light on the extraordinary pressure applied by Israeli authorities to push local communities to leave the area and the impact this has on people's physical as well as mental health. The report comes from a study of Palestinians in and around Masafa Yatta. located in the southern west bank of the occupied palestinian territories uh, the people there residents there uh, face the constant fear of eviction seeing their homes and other infrastructure including schools and playgrounds of course demolished having their movements restricted and other intense challenges abdul joins us now with details abdul from the perspective of someone who has been uh, covering uh, pa- palestine for for a while and and all of the issues surrounding it and how it's sort of this perfect storm for those living uh, in uh, in the occupied territories particularly uh, what does this report further highlight and underline in terms of our understanding of the situation well uh, it is unique in a way when we talk about occupation we talk about uh, violence and its uh, uh, its impact on the larger palestinian population we usually do not talk about the mental health issues so this particular uh, report highlights apart from talking about other uh, uh, issues of course talks about how uh, the re- repeated assaults or attempts to kind of displace palestinians from their homes their land uh, by the israeli occupation forces and uh, violence unleashed by settlers from time to time mm. basically has a men- uh, an impact on the mental health of the palestinians 
uh, as well. It talks about uh, how uh, uh, the, vill the villagers uh, living in different villages in the region, which are to be affected, uh, which is which are already affected, of course, by repeated demolition of their schools, uh, mm. their health centers, mm. their homes, of course, and the other civilian infrastructure. Uh, the children in particular, because out of the thousand people who are directly being affected by this particular derive to evacuate or to uh, displace Palestinians from that uh, 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 set of villages mm -hmm. uh, in Masafiriyata, uh, half of them are children below the age of 18. And those children basically are suffering from different kind of uh, 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 traumas caused by uh, uh, the fear, but in particular that they, they will no longer have the access to their is schools, they uh, of course they do not have any access to their other, for example, playgrounds and so on and so forth in the, mm. in the neighborhood, and they they are they are living in fear that their homes, uh, which their parents have built where they were living, they are used to live, will not be there anymore. So uh, this basically has created a very strong mental uh, health issue uh, among the children. And that basically is highlighted by this particular report. Apart from that, apart from that, the report also talks about how the demolition uh, uh, of uh, civilian infrastructure, which include the primary health centers in, in the locality, mm -hmm. has basically deprived Palestinians from accessing uh, their daily, uh, uh, basically, uh, medical care, the health care mm -hmm. in, in the locality. So this is one part which uh, uh, the report highlights, and then of course it uh, appeals to the rally of occupation, occupation to stop uh, at least demolishing the civilian infrastructure, but very strongly also talks about uh, the lack of international intervention, particularly mm -hmm. from the United Nations and other uh, uh, similar organizations. Yeah. All right. Uh Abdul, the, the fact that the report is concentrating on mental health and, and is focused so much on children, uh, does that uh, sort of expand uh, the kind of conversation point or the dialogues around the issues faced in Palestine? I think, see, the issues by and large are quite well known. Hmm. Uh, it is not that uh, uh, there is lack of data or lack of information from the occupied territories, yeah. the kind of different kind of issues people face on day to day basis, Palestinians are facing on day to day basis. That is quite well known and well recorded. There are uh, uh, numerous organizations, uh, both local and international, which are working uh, in the region and they have the data. The, the problem is uh, that data is not processed where it should be processed and there is no attempt to address the concerns raised to, to uh, that data. And that that's why this report uh, spent a, a significant amount, significant space on emphasizing the uh, 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 of the need of immediate international intervention, hmm. uh, which often is basically is not there and there is complete impunity when it hmm. comes to uh, Israelis doing whatever they want to do uh, with the occupied uh, Palestinians. And, and that's why this basically becomes important. Uh, not that it opens new avenues, new set of data, which was not available. That is not the case, of course. Hmm. All right. Thanks very much, Abdul, for that update. Right. Re reality checks, uh, as well as hope uh, for the future, this May Day. And with that, we'll uh, put a close to this episode of the Daily Debrief. As always, uh, we invite you to head to our website, peoplesdispatch.org to look at these stories and all of the other work uh, we do throughout the year. Don't also forget to give us a follow on the social media platform of your choice. We'll be back again tomorrow, same time, same place. Until then, goodbye.